Okay. Um, what you see here is a picture of uh, a Thorcon Isle, which is one of these. It's shaped like a big barge. There are two of them here. So this is a, each one is 500 megawatts. So between there, this would be a, a one gigawatt power plant. That would be enough to supply a city of 1 million people in to Western standards. Um, in between, you see what we call a can ship. It's what brings in uh, new reactor cores and brings in new fuel and takes away the old reactor cores. This is a special purpose ship built to international standards for transporting nuclear materials. We keep the complexity of operations at the power plant as simple as possible. And we move all of the more complex operations to a centralized facility that can service up to 50 gigawatts worth of power plants. In the foreground here, you see these chimneys. This is for removing decay heat. We'll talk a lot more about that. One of the most important things for safety in a nuclear power plant is being able to remove decay heat under all circumstances. Uh, it was the failure to do that that caused the problem at uh, Fukushima. As we look further back, you'll see these large yellow things. They are very large. They are 10 meters by 10 meters. They are hatch covers, uh, doors in the ship world. So in shipping, the doors are placed in the ceiling and by removing the hatch covers, we can get direct access to all the machinery inside the power plant and can be able to replace it as needed. Uh, that can only be done because we are at low pressure. We'll talk more about the pressure later, but um, having a very large door is not compatible with having a high pressure system. So uh, because molten salt does not turn to a gas until over 1400 degrees C, we don't build up the pressures and we can afford to have large doors, which makes maintenance much more practical. This is the reactor section here, and then heat exchanger sections, and then this section, long section here is for the turbine generator, and then at the end is the um, transformers and circuit breakers, uh, sort of the switch yard, and then connects to the grid there. On the side here, you see housing for staff and visiting regulators and such. This is also where the control room would be back here. This chimney is for uh, what we call the auxiliary boiler. Uh, it, during cold startup, we have the capability to run a diesel boiler that will help us start the plant. That allows us to start the plant in something called Black Start, which we'll talk more on later. Um, but it means that the plant can start up by itself without connection to the grid, uh, which is an important property for maintaining, for recovering the grid after a, a, a big problem has occurred. Most power plants do not have that capability. Okay, this chart shows the worldwide uh, electricity consumption in dark blue and then the fraction of it that is uh, fossil supplied is in black. The dotted section is a forecast out to 2040. Um, and this is all based on the US Energy Information Agency. All that growth is really coming from the developing world. Um, the US and Europe, our, our electricity consumption will not be going up significantly. But to put an idea of scale, this is measured in gigawatts. A large nuclear power, power plant is about one gigawatt. So we're looking at a slope here of about 100 gigawatts per year of growth. And basically that's to supply electricity to the developing world as their economies grow. Uh, there is some that has come about because of the world population. Right now we're at about 7 billion people. 
it'll probably stabilize in the 10 to 12 billion people range. But there's possibility that we need a lot more electricity um, in that uh, transport right now is primarily done based on oil. And it's unlikely that oil supplies will expand enough to let the whole world have transport the way the West does. So there's a very good chance that transport will move over towards electricity, similarly for industrial heat. So that could make the demand go very much higher. Of the various power sources that could supply that quantity of uh, power, nuclear is really the only one that can do that with a low environmental impact but it won't be chosen unless it is also very safe and the lowest cost solution. So that's the goal of what we're trying to design here. And we'd like to see 70 to 80% of the electricity generated in the world generated from nuclear with the remainder from primarily hydro, but also some other sources. Um, Worldwide, most of the electricity is generated by hydrocarbon based. That's also true in Indonesia. This shows the fraction from here to there that is hydrocarbon based. And this is the fraction that is non-carbon dioxide producing of which the vast majority is hydro. Um, however, expanding hydro to supply all the power is a problem. You end up damming the rivers and that changes their environment quite dramatically. In the US, we've dammed up almost all of our rivers and I hope we don't dam up all the rivers in the world. Of the clean uh, sources, we have hydro. Um, my background is Norwegian and Norway happens to be blessed with a lot of hydro. Uh, but then the next biggest source is nuclear. Uh, wind and solar are noticeable, but not dominant sources. Um, and they bring with them quite severe challenges to the grid. In California, we've had blackouts because we depend so much on solar that um, when the sun goes down, we can run out of electricity. Nuclear is really the one that is easiest to rapidly expand. If we look at Indonesia's needs, you need five to 10, and as your economy grows more rapidly, maybe up to 20 gigawatts of additional electricity each year for the next 40 years or so. Uh, we plan to build a yard in Indonesia to build the power plants to meet Indonesia's needs and also to export to neighboring countries. Uh, one large shipyard can produce that quantity of uh, power plants. The total demand for the world is about 100 gigawatts a year for about 100 years. I mean, where that goes will shift over time, but it's going to take quite a while before Africa finishes building out their uh, economies. Okay, let's tackle one of the big scary questions that people bring up, which is what about the waste? Um, can we uh, take care of the waste that comes from nuclear power plants? So to look at that, it's a good idea to get the right scale. Uh, typical European or US citizen uses around one kilowatt electricity on average, including the industrial use. Our power plant would generate about 30 tons of spent fuel per gigawatt year, which amounts to about 30 grams per person. If you add that up over 60 years, it would fill one little water bottle. If you generated that same amount of electricity from coal, it would fill a room that's four meters by five meters, 300 meters tall, as tall as the Gamma Tower in Jakarta. That would be your personal waste. So when it comes to waste, the story for nuclear is actually, we generate very, very little. There are technologies around that we could even reduce that by another order of magnitude, but it's important to understand that even right where we are today with once through, the amount of waste is not very much. 
This is a picture of what we call dry cast storage, uh, where they put the waste from a power plant in the US inside cylinders that are inside a container that's inside a concrete cylinder, one of these casks. The concrete in the container provides shielding so that you can work, you can stand. If you look real close, there's a person standing there. You can stand and hug these things. There's not, this is not an intense radiation field. Um, and it'll sit there. Uh, it can sit there for as long as you like. Um, no one has ever been hurt by spent fuel anywhere in the world. This pad would be enough to store all of the spent fuel from uh, a power plant for a city of a million people for 80 years. Uh, in our case, our dry cast storage is inside the hull. If you look real close, you'll see this tall cylinder here that consumes about five meters of our power plant, 180 meters long and it'll store all the fuel, spent fuel from the power plant. So we store it right on site, inside, without it ever leaving the power plant. And then the question is, well, what do we do with our water bottle worth of spent fuel after 80 years? Well, 80 years from now, technology will change quite a lot. I mean, just try to picture what technology was at 80 years ago. So predicting where things will go 80 years into the future is pretty challenging. Um, you're not likely to be right. They probably will do a better job than whatever we predict. But it's good to have at least some answer. Uh, and one answer is that we can take advantage of uh, the technology that's been developed for drilling for oil. So with that, they drill a a vertical pipe down very far. In our case, we're drawing it down um, about five, five kilometers deep into the earth. This is very far below the water table. Here's the water table up here, and we're way below that. And then you can turn the corner and have a nearly horizontal section. It actually slopes up slightly, and you can put the spent fuel in that. If somehow some water got there, it'll go uphill towards the dead end of the trap. So this is a way that we can uh, put the spent fuel deep underground at very low cost. Uh, from a single vertical hole, they can drill up to 20 horizontal paths, sort of radially out. That would be enough to store all of Indonesia's waste if it all came from nuclear for the next hundred years. So, uh, Bataan has responsibility for taking care of the waste. And the plan is generally to take one of the uninhabited islands and use that as the base to uh, take the waste and store it. Um, again, though, it is entirely likely that before we ever get to storing the waste 80 years from now, that we'll have a better plan than this. So the tiny waste generation is actually an advantage for nuclear. Unlike coal, or uh, which generates large volume of ash and puts a large volume, even 10 times as much into the air, or even gas, which puts its waste into the air, nuclear takes care of its waste. And we have a, a plan for where, where it goes. Because it's so small, we can keep it all contained. So the tiny amount of waste generated by nuclear is actually an advantage compared to other technologies. Next, I'd like to put some scale to um, radiation dose, because we really don't have a good feeling as a general public for what doses are dangerous and which doses are tolerable. So this is a scale put out by the Canadian regulator. At the top here, we have 1,000 millisieverts. If you get a dose of 1,000 millisieverts in a short time, say a day, you will get sick. You will suffer symptoms of radiation sickness. You will survive in all likelihood, but 
you'll 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 have had a an unpleasant time to be sure. Um, if you have a big disaster, uh, the authorized limits for workers that are working to try to save lives is 500 millisieverts. So that's a pretty serious dose. Um, if you're working on the space station, you get 150 millisieverts in a year. If you're a nuclear worker, the legal limit internationally is 100 millisieverts over five years. That's the place where we can first detect some health effects from radiation. If you get 100 millisieverts in a short time, we can start to detect some health impact. But you probably will feel just fine. It's just we can, we can see something. Nuclear workers are allowed to get 50. If you get a chest x-ray, it's about seven. The regulatory limit for uh, the public is at one millisievert. That's a factor of a thousand below what's dangerous. So it's important to know that in the event there is ever a spill, just because it goes over one millisievert doesn't mean it's dangerous. You're still a long, long way away from dangerous. Okay. Our design philosophy is to, of course, we have to be safe. We have to be able to convince the public that it's safe. It has to be cheap. It has to be cost competitive with coal or we won't make a big dent in the world. We might sell some and make some money, but we won't really change the trajectory of the world right now, which is to build an awful lot of coal and gas. Uh, to be useful, it really needs to be reliable. Um, not, you know, wind and solar are very politically popular, but because they don't, uh, they, they aren't reliable. Uh, we can't really base society on it. Um, I know a lot of people are trying uh, and uh, we're suffering some blackouts because the sun actually does set and we get no solar power when it, the sun is gone. Uh, in Europe, they depend on solar and wind, but during the very cold winters, you typically will have no wind and no sun. Uh, and that's when people want to turn on more heat. So you really need a system that's reliable. Um, and that really reduces us to hydro where you have rivers available to dam, coal, gas, and nuclear. Um, coal and gas are gonna be putting out a lot of carbon and with coal, you get a lot of other junk too. So we think we can provide carbon-free, safe, cheap, reliable electricity, and very importantly, that we can produce it in the near term. Because uh, however long it takes us to build nuclear is how long other power plants, particularly coal power plants, will be built. And once built, they're not likely to be taken down. So our target is decent nuclear now rather than excellent nuclear in the future. And Difference between decent and excellent is that we need to have a continual supply of enriched uranium. So we are what's called a burner. We, we get fuel in all the time. There's more advanced versions of reactors that breed their own fuel. Um, and so they don't need the, the continual supply of enriched uranium, but those will take longer to develop. They're much trickier, much more challenging to develop. And so they won't be here as soon. So we're gonna start with the burner now, get it done as quick as we can, and then evolve later to more of a breeder. Uh, very important property is that it be inherently safe. Uh, we need to be able to combat fear of nuclear. Uh, with the molten salt reactor, we have no mechanism to widely spread reactivity. The, Unlike a light water reactor where you have water under enormous pressure as a liquid, we have salt that is far away from its boiling point. So there is no, uh, in a light water reactor you have, when water turns to steam, it expands by 500 fold and that can push stuff out into the, env uh, into the environment. In our case, if something goes wrong, a big pipe breaks, 
it's like a water pipe breaks in, in your house. It'll spill and make a mess inside the building, but there's nothing that's pushing it hard to go outside. Uh, we believe that it needs to be passively safe, that there's no operator action or interaction that can cause a release, no electricity or lack of machinery or electricity or machinery that can that is needed to be able to prevent a release. Um, that's important because with a lot of power plants, things will go wrong and people will make mistakes. Every accident we've had so far has involved people making mistakes. So we have to be sure that the consequence of that is not a release, but rather that it is perhaps something breaks in the power plant and it costs us money, but it doesn't endanger the public. In order to be cost competitive, we have to be producing this at about a dollar a watt. This is about a factor of 10 lower than what our current nuclear power plants are. We believe it has to be replaceable modules. Um, current nuclear power plants design with the idea that everything is gonna work for 60 years, which means they have to design with extreme margins. They uh, have to test for a long time. And even at that, a major failure can, can be a real problem because it's not really designed to be replaced. Um, in our case, we have big doors on top that makes so the replacement of any module can be done in a matter of a couple of months. And we're trying to push for a rapid deployment. Uh, we think we can get to a full scale prototype within four years. The reason we have that kind of confidence is that we have built bigger things before. So on the left is one of the world's largest uh, oil tankers. It's a class, they created a whole new class because of these ultra large crude carriers. Um, we built those for under $100 million. We built four of them. We designed them and managed the building of them. The actual construction was done by a Korean firm, DSME. The power plant we're proposing is about 60% the size of one of these. So we've already built bigger things. We know how to do it. And we're going back to the same company that built these to build the power plants. So we're very confident that we know how to build it and that we can get it done. This shows the a cutaway of the power plant. Starting at this end, here's the spent, or first off you have three meters of uh, double hull that provides physical protection against things like aircraft strikes and tornadoes and things of that nature. Then it also provides a radiation shield. Then you have the spent fuel storage. Then next we have a pond for removing decay heat, which we'll talk a lot more about later. The reactor itself is this one here. So you can see it's a small fraction of the total power plant. Then you have a series of heat exchangers, finally ending up with generating steam. Then that goes through the high pressure turbine, the intermediate pressure turbine, and the low pressure turbines. So this is all converting steam to rotation. And then this is the generator that converts it to electricity. And then finally you have uh, the transformers and the circuit breakers, the switch yard that is typically outside and takes much more space. In our case, we're using gas insulated switch yards and having it internal to the power plant. And then down here, you've got diesel fuel and water and a desalination plant and the big seawater cooling pumps. So what we have is a complete power plant built into a hull. We do all the construction at the, power, at the uh, shipyard. So we're using people who have been doing this kind of work for 30 years and who have lots of automated machinery to help them do it. So we get um, very known productivity. Uh, typical contracts are firm fixed price and delivery within typically a year. So that, that's very important because nuclear industry has a history of build times more than 10 years and costs that double or triple what the original estimate was. Uh, so if we can build on schedule in short time, it saves a lot of the money. You know, if you borrow money for 10 years, you'll pay a lot in interest. 
we have a four year cycle. So the whole reactor is contained inside of a can. Inside the can, there's graphite, which wears out after four years. So the cycle is we use one for four years, then we turn it off and leave it in place, let the radioactivity decay away, and we switch over to use the second one for the, the four years while the first one is cooling. And then we come in and take the first one that's co cooled out and put in a new one and switch the fuel over again. So we ping pong back and forth. It's a duplex system. But it's replaceable modules that you don't open on site, kind of like uh, your laser cartridge that you, you take a convenient package in and out and you don't fuss with what's inside of it. We'll do that elsewhere. Um, the actual heat transport path is shown here. Um, I'm not going to go through all these numbers because of time, but for the engineering students, you can see this is the pressure in absolute uh, bar. So two and a half atmospheres of pressure here. So the pump, this, this is the maximum strain here, which is less than your garden hose. So, you know, it doesn't take exotic materials or uh, big thick forgings to handle this kind of pressure. In contrast, a light water reactor is at about 160 bar. And so there they have to have eight inch thick, eight inch, I shouldn't do that. Um, well, they have to have very thick, uh, I think 20 centimeters thick steel to be able to contain the pressure. And if something goes wrong, there's all that pressure to push stuff out. Uh, we don't have that. We have salt that's at modest pressure. If something goes wrong, it'll spill and go to the floor. We go through a series of heat exchangers, first to go to a secondary salt that is chemically compatible with the fuel salt, and then second to go to a solar salt used in solar salt concentrating plants that is chemically compatible with steam. And then steam, here we do have the high pressure because that's part of the power cycle. An important property is that um, we have an open standpipe, so should the steam pipes break and put a lot of pressure back, they get uh, blown out in the first loop here and it doesn't propagate, oops, all the way back to the, where the radiation is in the fuel salt. And then the power conversion cycle is a standard single reheat, just like is what's used in a lot of coal power plants. If you like to see pictures, it goes from a reactor core, the salt goes through the first heat exchanger, through a second heat exchanger, through the steam generator. And then if to put it into scale, here's the reactor, there's the series of heat exchangers going off, and then starting here is where we have the turbine hall. And from here and over to the right, it's very similar to a coal power plant. And so we have costs for that portion that matches what the coal power plant folks have. Um, again, I'm not gonna go through all the details on this, but if you're an engineering student on the power conversion side, this is, gives you all the details of uh, our power conversion from a single reheater, high pressure, intermediate pressure, low pressure turbines, uh, you have three, uh, three low pressure feed water heaters, the deaerator, and then four high pressure feed water heaters. Overall, though, an important number is if you have 20 degrees C cooling water coming in, we will get net effective power of 47% thermal efficiency. That's actually better than you get from a, even the more advanced coal power plants. Um, and that's because we don't have to transport uh, all the fuel. Uh, coal power plant, a big portion of the power plant is involved with just moving all the fuels uh, as they have to move, I think it's on the order of 10,000 tons a day. Uh, just to give you a picture of it, this is the uh, turbines and the generator and the power conversion. So from here and over to the left, 
All of that is very similar to a coal power plant. And you can see that the nuclear section is actually pretty small compared to the whole power plant. If you picture it from the side, here's the seawater inlets, the uh, low pressure feed water heaters and the high pressure feed water heaters. This stack is for the auxiliary boiler for Blackstart, which we'll talk more about later. Over here, you can see the spent fuel storage with the air intake and exhaust. So this is cooled by natural circulation of air. So it can sit there, it takes no power. Um, it, it just sits there and cools itself that way. Um, and this is the cooling pond for decay heat removal. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, the reactor core is right here. Um, it's four, meter, four and a half meters tall and six and a half meters in diameter. Uh, and it's filled, 90% of it is graphite and about 10% is the fuel salt. The graphite serves as a moderator, slows the neutrons down. Uh, so you have not quite a sphere, but pretty close to a sphere, an ideal configuration to achieve critical mass. <clears throat> and the moderator is necessary to slow down the neutrons. If you don't have the moderator, you're not going to be critical. So this is where all fission happens. As soon as you leave there, you, you're no longer critical and the fission will stop. It goes up to a pump. This is an impeller with a header tank and up top above the radiation barrier is where the motor is. So it's accessible to people. Back here is a U-shaped heat exchanger. And then the cooled fuel salt goes back around down the bottom. So it comes in at 565, goes up, goes out at 704, and circles around. The secondary salt comes in here, picks up the heat from the fuel salt and cools the fuel salt down and goes up so that, that that brings the heat, transports the heat to the next stage. You're flowing at about three tons per second, about one cubic meter per second. So it's got a pretty good flow. These pipes are about half a meter in diameter. An important point is that the first containment barrier is this red one here we call the can. It's at 350 degrees C. It has inert gases on both sides and has modest stress. There's no big pressure differential. So uh, for mechanical engineers in the crowd, you understand that this, this barrier is not under any particular stress. Um, should a pipe break, the salt will fall to the bottom and then drain out the bottom. There's a fire brick type liner on the bottom to keep the 700 degree salt away from the steel, although the steel can take the 700 degrees C. Um, so that even in accident conditions, this one is not seriously challenged. We have just enough fuel in there to have the reactor running, uh, as opposed to a light water reactor where you refuel every year and a half. It means that in the light water reactor, they have to put in extra fuel so that it lasts for a year and a half. In our case, our fuel lasts basically for one day and then it drops down low. You notice a substantial temperature drop as we burn up some of the fuel. So we add fuel continually. We have the, the what we call the makeup tank. Makeup fuel is this green one here. Uh, so we'll add about a liter of fuel per day. There's 15 cubic meters of fuel in the core, and then we add about one liter more each day. So over a four year period, we'll add about two cubic meters. All that extra fuel is contained in this green tank. The yellow one in front of it is a thorium makeup tank that's used to <coughs> uh, reduce reactivity when we stop the pump. Um, if you've studied a little bit about molten salt reactors, you know that uh, there are things called delayed neutrons and some of them are outside. When you stop the pump, they return to the core and they increase reactivity. So when you stop the pump, you need something to be able to reduce reactivity and we use the thorium for that. The fuel in here is 85% thorium and 15% uranium. 
um, the thorium ends up generating about 25% of our total power. These large tanks are for off gas. The about 40% of the fission products are, <coughs> are uh, gases, xenon and krypton, and they are not soluble in the salt. So they will bubble out like you get carbon dioxide bubbles out of your soda when you open the, the bottle. Uh, and when they bubble out, we uh, collect them and we put them through these big tanks where they have about one week before to decay before they leave. That way we keep almost all of the radioactive material inside the can. So by the time it leaves, we've had 98% of the radioactivity has decayed away. Below this, you can see uh, these green cylinders. Let me see, if they're, yeah. Uh, at the very bottom here, barely visible, is this gray thing. That is the freeze valve. That's an important safety feature. Um, the freeze valve is a section of pipe that has cold helium push pumped onto it continuously to freeze a section of salt and block the pipe. If you ever stop pumping the cold helium, that freeze valve will melt and open and drain the salt by gravity. So if you lose electricity, you lose the pump that drives the helium and that will cause the the fuel salt to drain out. If we have many temperature sensors, if any of them are too high, they will uh, open a circuit so that it cuts off electricity to the helium pump and cause the drain. <coughs> that is done with a thermal couple. Uh, it's a bimetallic thing that uh, opens up by physics should the temperature get too hot. So no electricity is required for those sensors. It's all physics that says if things get too hot, it's going to open up and drain. And when it drains, that will stop the fission and place the fuel salt down here in these green tanks. These green tanks, there's 32 of them, and they hold the fuel salt. And you notice this geometry is the exact opposite of a critical mass. We're spreading the fuel out as far as possible. You cannot get criticality in these tanks. Uh, even if you surround them by a moderator like water, which normally they're surrounded by uh, inert gas, they still are not critical. So we know as soon as the drain happens, there is no chance of recriticality. That's an important thing because in light water reactors, there's a lot of speculation in the news about recriticality and what if it gets to the water table, et cetera. There's no chance of that with with our setup. We can def definitively say as engineers, as soon as the fuel salt is in the drain tank, you don't need to think about recriticality anymore at all. The drain tanks are not insulated. Um, they're surrounded by inert gas and they transfer heat by radiation to the cold wall. Uh, radiation is uh, Transfers, the heat transferred by radiation is to the fourth power of temperature. So as you increase temperature, it'll radiate much more heat. If you double the temperature, you end up radiating 16 times more heat. Uh, in our simulations, the maximum heat transfer we see is about seven megawatts. Uh, you can, mechanically, you could transfer a lot more heat this way, but uh, that's as much as we need to. Uh, we verified that both by equations and by CFD simulations. We will test this in the pre-fission platform as well. Uh, okay, I'll talk to that in a little bit. Once the heat gets into the cold wall, the cold wall, actually, let me show one other thing. The cold wall is steel and then water and steel, about a half meter thick of water. So when the heat goes, it heats that steel, that'll boil the water. The bubbles in the water will, will cause a flow to go up. So we get a natural circulation of the water here. That flows up and over to a radiator that's in the bottom of a pond. That'll heat up the water in the pond and evaporate that water. We have 5,000 cubic meters of water here per PMOD. 
and then there's two P mods for an aisle. That gives us enough water that <coughs> evaporation will take care of the decay heat for 165 days. Uh, up until Fukushima, the, the international accepted standard was to have enough cooling for three days. After Fukushima, they've expanded that to seven days. Although in Japan, they really didn't get good cooling until 14 days. Uh, our argument is that we're going to the developing world. It's not as prepared for dealing with challenges as Japan was. So we should really be able to run ourselves for a lot longer. Um, we are able to run for 165 days with the water that's there. And at that point, the decay heat is small enough that air cooling will take over. So we actually can run forever and keep removing the decay heat and not have a problem. Notice that this system takes no electricity, no pumps, no operators, and there's no valves. So we avoid all the problems that we've had before. A competing system is the AP1000 in the US. We have about 10 times as much water for removing decay heat as the AP1000. So we've really gone thorough overboard on being able to remove decay heat because that has been the Achilles heel of nuclear power plants so far. We will test that first in a pre-fission test platform. <coughs> this one has a full scale nuclear island uh, and, but it has no fission. So we'll use electricity to do the fission and to, to generate the heat and be able to do engineering measurements. And one of the things we'll do is to use electricity to simulate uh, an emergency drain to put heat as if it was decay heat into it and show that the cold wall and its pond uh, do the job that we're claiming and actually make measurements to confirm the analysis that says the real system does what we say it will do. We believe testing is very, very important because despite all of our computer models and equations, sometimes things don't work the way we expect. Uh, we have simulated what happens in an accident that's worse than Fukushima. So at Fukushima, you still had electricity for 45 minutes until the tsunami hit, and then that flooded out the diesel generators. That first 45 minutes is very important to uh, reduce, to remove the decay heat because it drops off quite quickly. But we were able to handle, assuming that the electricity gets cut off instantly. So that would be like the quake happened right next to the power plant and the tsunami arrived right away. We assume no operator intervention. Uh, at Fukushima, they lost lights. So pretty quickly they were not able, the operators weren't able to see anything to do anything. Um, the shutdown rods did work. We assume no shutdown rods. And with that, this blue line is the fission power. That's two minutes. So in about 80 seconds, the power has dropped off. All these lines are the temperature at various places in, in the reactor core. And um, this is the various contributors to reactivity. But what we get is uh, when we simulate this, we will see uh, some creep damage to the plant, but there's no release and no permanent damage to, no, no significant damage to the plant. So in order to combat fear and to give the comp, the public and the government confidence that an evacuation isn't necessary, we will actually take our demonstration plant and after we've practiced first with the pre-fission plant and then practiced with the demonstration plant at lower power levels and finally to the full power level, once we got everything debugged, then we'll invite the press and the politicians to be present when we do a test that is of a Fukushima type accident and show them that the plant knows how to take care of it. We will 
not have a release even in something as bad as a Fukushima accident. And for that reason, there is no reason to fear, no reason to do an evacuation. Evacuations under natural disaster conditions are dangerous. Uh, Japan lost about 1,600 people because of the evacuation itself. Um, evacuating hospitals when roads are broken is uh, a difficult thing. Okay, um, when we uh, start up a plant uh, in Indonesia, you've got a lot of different grids. Um, so we think we're going to need to be able to start our plant even if there isn't a grid already running. Uh, so we have ability to do a cold start. We include a couple of one megawatt, one and a half megawatt diesel generators to start up the century turbine and the auxiliary boiler. The auxiliary boiler is basically a, a diesel uh, fireplace that um, is used to generate a modest amount of electricity, 15 megawatts. That is used to start up the main turbine and the main pumps and get the fission process going. In almost all power plants, they depend on getting that startup electricity from the grid. So if the whole grid goes down, you can't start those power plants. And Jakarta experienced that, I don't know, it was a year and a half ago or so, uh, where they had just a few power plants that were able to start the grid when the grid was down. And of those, not all of them worked. So it took them a very long time to get the grid back up again. If the grid is down for a short time, we can stay in hot stand standby. Uh, so if it's down for eight hours or something, then we can stay in hot standby where the nuclear island generates the ongoing heat and is ready to fire up very quickly once the, the grid is reestablished. Uh, if you've been studying uh, molten salt reactors, um, one of the questions is about off-gas handling. Um, in a light water reactor, all the off-gas is kept contained inside of a fuel rod, which builds a big pressure, but they figured out how to handle that. In a molten salt reactor, the, the radioactive gases come off. And they are a significant source of radioactivity. So, and they're mobile, it's a gas. So we do need to focus on how do we keep it contained. And we do that by having a flow of helium that keeps the radioactive gases from going up into the pump. Then it goes into a header space in the, in the header tank. Um, at this point, the off gases are generating about a megawatt of power but that's being sprayed by the fuel salt. So all that thermal energy is recovered and used to generate electricity. After about a day, it goes into the two orange tanks that are inside the can. These give uh, enough delay line to uh, allow one week's worth of storage so that most 98% of the decay heat is now removed and what's goes over to the basement where we have very large tanks is radioactive noble gases that have stable daughters. So things like krypton and xenon are noble gases. They're called that because they don't chemically react with anything. If you breathe it in, you will breathe it right back out again. If it gets dispersed to the atmosphere, it'll disperse and spread according to ideal gas properties. It doesn't get concentrated by plants. So these gases are, are not nearly as dangerous as the other radioactive materials. But we keep them stored in large tanks and then we separate them using cryogenics into xenon, which by the time it gets to this bottle, there's no radioactivity left and this can just be sold as a product. And krypton, which would have a krypton 85, um, that is a 10 year half-life uh, noble gas that is often used as a tracer gas to find small leaks. So we could legally just re release this to the atmosphere, but we do collect it instead. And 
either sell it or just store it. And then the helium is recirculated back around. So the off gas never leaves the plant, except as these gas bottles. We produce about 10 gas bottles um, in four years. So the amount of gas bottles we produce is not much. Lots of numbers for those that are interested in that. Uh, and the heat here, you can see the one megawatt of heat that gets produced in the header tank. And then the heat drops to 200 kilowatts, 15 kilowatts, and we're still inside of the can. By the time we get into the basement, we're talking 20 kilowatts of power and dropping pretty rapidly. Um, this is the cryogenic cooling system. It uses compressed helium as the coolant. Um, this is used in your medical office for uh, magnetic resonance Im imaging. They use helium cooling like this. And we grab, we basically freeze the xenon and grab that, put it into bottles, and then we freeze the krypton and put that into bottles. Okay, one of the important properties in order to make a difference is we have to be able to compete economically. If we're more expensive, like nuclear right now is more expensive than coal, people will choose coal. Um, so if we're going to make a difference in the world, we really have to be able to compete economically. This is a comparison of a coal power plant, uh, 68 meters tall, 135 meters wide compared to our power plant, which is 30 meters tall and 38 meters top wide. So we're very much smaller. This is, these are drawings are to scale and they're both for a 500 megawatt electric power plant. Uh, beyond that, you have the turbine generator, which is the same for both. But there's every reason to believe that we should be able to beat the coal folks in terms of costs. And we've had that validated by, um, the uh, big shipyards um, for most of the costs, not all of it, but, but most of it. So the way we plan on doing this is we'll use a big shipyard for building the uh, hull, we'll tow it to the site, we'll ballast it down to the seabed so it can be placed in anywhere from dredging a channel in land to up to about 10 meters deep water. If the water is deep, then we want to build a breakwater around it to keep uh, large ships from being able to run into us. And then every four years, a can ship will come along and deliver uh, new, new fuel and new cans and take away the old ones. The cans will go initially just to a storage area, but eventually to a recycling area where we can replace the graphite, clean up the can, and then put it back into service. The reason we can build this cost competitively is that we're using the shipyards. Um, here you see one person operating, in this case, four machines in this picture. In the factories right now, they, they have one person operating 80 welding machines in parallel. That allows them to have very high productivity and makes it so that we can build our whole hull, our whole ship for about $200 million. Uh, one of these power, one of these shipyards can build 20 gigawatts worth of power plants a year. There is a lot of surplus shipbuilding capacity in the world right now, enough that it could meet the entire demand of 100 gigawatts a year with just existing shipyard capacity. So we have the capacity to build enough power plants to satisfy world demand. We are currently working together with Argonne National Labs to measure different salt properties. This is Mel Rose. She's one of the people we're working with uh, using glove boxes to measure uh, properties of the salt that we need. Uh, another activity you have going on with, uh, Ar with Argonne is developing uh, sensors, uh, electrochemical sensors for measuring properties in, in situ. That was supposed to be done in June, but COVID has slowed down all lab work. So it'll be December before we get those results finally. We've also been working with PT PAL.
setelah kami mempelajari uh, requirement daripada Torcon terhadap uh, DSMR 500 yang uh, dipercayakan kepada kami untuk dibangun beberapa part terutama uh, bagian dari uh, reaktornya uh, secara teknis uh, kami uh, sangat yakin bisa kita laksanakan di PT ini jadi secara teknis tidak ada isu terhadap uh, kemampuan kami di dalam uh, membangun uh, reaktor yang diminta oleh Torpon. Um, they there are components that we think that they can build. Um, they built heat exchangers and stuff before. Uh, we've gone to them and checked out their facilities and talked to them, presented them with what we need in terms of building the reactor vessel. They believe they can build it. Um, the cost estimates have come in roughly where we need them to be. So we are hopeful that uh, PT PAL can be the uh, factory that builds the cans themselves. Uh, they may also provide some of the heat exchangers. We haven't really focused on that yet, but that becomes a significant business and has been folded into PT PAL's plans. Um, DSME, we've gone to several times to talk about building the the big ships. The ships are large enough that there's no shipyard in Indonesia that can do it yet. Uh, but we'll do the first half dozen or so in the Korean shipyards, and then DSME will work together with us to build a power plant factory in Indonesia to build future power plants. And we're also talking with PT Tima and others about providing thorium uh, as, and the fuel salt. Uh, together with Baton, they've already built a laboratory scale process to, to purify the thorium. Thorium is a byproduct of their existing uh, tin and rare earth mining activities. So they'd like to be the supplier for that. So we think we can have a significant portion, if not most of the power plant, built in Indonesia, first licensed in Indonesia, supplying electricity for Indonesia, and being an export from Indonesia. So in summary, the energy needs of the world are very large, but nuclear can deliver. It's safe, even with human errors, even with no electricity. The Regulations are set at one millisievert per year, and we will meet that. <clears throat> but I want to be sure the, the public knows that the danger level is very much larger. It's a thousand times higher. Okay. Um, and we're targeting a cost of six to seven cents per kilowatt hour. That's competitive with coal here. Okay. I think I will stop there and take okay. questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lars Jorgensen. Uh, so it's, uh, the question for Lars Jorgensen is already explained regarding about uh, molten salt reactor, which is very, very competitive compared with, you know, the current technology for nuclear power reactor. So it means he explained regarding about um, the cost and also the safety as well. So please raise your hand and then you can ask directly to Master Lars Jorgensen. Hello? 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 Okay. Well, yes, Prahadi, can I ask a question to uh, Dr. Jorgensen? Please mention your name and also where, where you're from. Where well, are you? Yes, my name is Gianni. Yes. Uh, I am student University of Universitas Blas Yeah. Okay. You can yeah. ask directly to. Well, uh, hello, Dr. Jeff Jensen, dear Gianni. It, it is a talk and make me curious about nuclear. I think. Well, I actually don't know much about nuclear. So my question is, um, if in the director is planned to be built in Indonesia. Then what role can we as student of university play to contribute it? Um, as you know, most of people still think that nuclear is dangerous. 
So as a big company, how can you convince people, especially Indonesian, that Nuclear is not dangerous? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Diani, yeah, from Fiji. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, this is uh, a question for you, uh, Mr. Lars. Yes, uh, there have been uh, three nuclear accidents that you can think of, uh, and they have made a lot of press and scared people. <coughs> uh, I think so, bro. Yeah, so uh, part of how we plan to help people understand it's not dangerous is by having a demonstration plant and demonstrating that the plant will safely contain and keep uh, from release even in the worst case accidents and actually do that as a live demonstration with the press and with the public. That's what we can do. I think uh, there's a role for the government and for the regulators as well to try to um, help people understand uh, about radiation. It's not something we normally understand, but if you look at the safety record, nuclear power actually is very safe um, and we need to communicate that. We do need to work very hard to communicate that to everybody. Uh, okay, got it. So at the first time, so we have to know more about nuclear, about the radiation, what is the radiation and then. Uh, actually, uh, I, don't want, I want to know if in the director is planned to put in Indonesia then what role can we as student of university play to contribute? Yes. So uh, as engineering students, uh, a nuclear power plant involves almost every engineering specialty. So there are lots of small uh, sub problems that could be broken out to uh, be used as student projects to be able to verify by simulation or by tests. Um, uh, yeah different pieces of the, of the problem. Um, we do envision that the power plant will evolve over time. Every four years, we replace the reactor core. So we can get, we can do improvements. And I would expect that we will, after we're established as a company uh, and have revenue from power plants that are producing electricity, that we will fund the universities to do R&D for what will come next. Uh, and what improvements we will do. Okay. And I would expect okay. that to go on for the next century. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. I see we have a question from the chat box. Um, yeah. How does TSMR systems respond to loss of coolant accidents? Okay. Right, so if you lose the coolant, um, the molten salt reactor is different than a light water reactor in that the coolant, the first coolant and the fuel are the same salt. So you, if you lose the coolant, it means you lost the fuel as well, which means it, we had a drain. It went down into the drain tank and from there it radiates to the cold wall and to the pond and we will remove the heat. Uh, so that is something that's in the basic design that that happens completely passively by physics. Uh, you could also mean loss of coolant means loss of the seawater or loss of the solar salt or secondary salt. So loss of, of coolant someplace in the heat transport path, in which case, again, we would drain it to the drain tanks and cool it with the same mechanism. So okay. in all those cases, there's no release at all and there is only in the very worst of those is there even any damage to the plant. Okay, thank you. Any any other question? Hello? Any other question? Yes. Hello. You, yes. Can you mention your name and then where, where you're from? Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity given to me. Uh, my name is Muhammad Iqbal. I'm from Gajah Mada University. So good morning, Dr. Lars Jorgensen. I have, yeah, I have a question here. So first, uh, what is the difference uh, between the nuclear power plant using uranium and the molten salt nuclear reactor using thorium? Okay. 
So the nuclear power plant using uranium, I presume you mean the light water reactors, like the current reactors that are deployed. They have solid fuel that stays in place and they use water, very purified water, as both the coolant and the um, moderator. If they get too hot, that water will boil and turn to steam, which means that you lose your cooling ability. Once, once it turns to steam, you get very little cooling and it'll get so hot and then the steam reacts with zirconium, uh, which will, the zirconium will steal the oxygen away from the, from the water, leaving hydrogen. And that's what happened at Fukushima, that that hydrogen collected in the, the ceiling area above the reactor. And at some point it got combined with oxygen and got a spark and that was the explosion you saw was the hydrogen explosion. A molten salt reactor is different in that the molten salt does not boil until 1400 degrees C. So we're using it at 700, it doesn't boil until 1400. We have 700 degrees C margin. We won't have a problem with uh, our liquid turning to a gas and dramatically increasing the pressure. Uh, and so if there is a problem, what will happen is that the liquid will fall and go down into the drain tanks. So the big differences are that the fuel and moderate, the fuel is the same as the coolant. So you can't lose the, the coolant without losing the fuel. We're at low pressure um, and we don't have any zirconium or any, any chemical reactions that can cause uh, extra challenges. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Hello? Hello? I, 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 uh, sorry, sorry. I, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry. Tell me. Raise your hand, please. Uh, my... Okay. Yes. Yuri, Yuri, Yuri. Okay, leave Yuri. I have a question for Mr. Yeah. Lars. Go ahead. Uh, the molten salt reactor is uh, using thorium because uh, the uranium is going to run out. But uh, there are still a bunch of uh, uranium. But uh, we're still using the uranium as well. Um, so my question is, uh, is it maybe possible that maybe someday we can achieve the thorium cool cycle with a hundred percent of thorium and uh, without using any of the uranium? Thank you. Okay, so uh, the thorium itself won't fission. It gets when it captures the neutron, it becomes uranium two thirty three, and that's what fissions. Going to a pure thorium cycle. Uh, you'd have to, to look at whether you're going with a uh, thermal cycle with a graphite moderator or a fast cycle. If you're in a thermal cycle, that was what was originally done by Oak Ridge. However, that results in uh, highly enriched uranium in the core. And it's debatable what the how, how the world will accept that. Um, the U.S. would oppose that um, because of concerns over proliferation. Uh, so more likely, I think, is that we go to a thorium cycle by going to a fast reactor, one without graphite in the core. Um, that is a research project being carried on right now in Europe, uh, Grenoble. Uh, so that is a possibility that you build a, what we call a breeder, that would be a reactor that makes as much fuel as it consumes or more, in which case you could feed it thorium and uh, not use any uranium. That, that will take more R&D. It is uh, more challenging both for the reactor core itself, but also it needs a significant chemical processing going on. Um, so the power plant itself is significantly more complicated. Um, so yes, I see that in the future, but 
I'd rather not wait the extra 20 years or so that it's going to take to have that ready. Um, so that's why we're going to start with the burner. And as we have uh, an income stream and we can take more time, we can uh, create the uh, fancier power plants that breed their own fuel. It is a question in the chat room, uh, Lars Jorgensen. Two, two questions, we, two questions for you. Okay, so I, I see some chat box questions. The first one is about burners versus breeder. Yeah. Uh, so the, the significant difference is that to be a breeder, we're going to need to have a chemical processing plant that removes the fission products from the um, fuel on site. And that plant uh, doesn't have to be huge, but it has to be well controlled and well monitored for proliferation concerns. So that, that takes a long time, not just technically, but what really takes a long time is the politics of it and, and getting you know, all, the, all the right permissions lined up. Uh, one of the advantages of an MSR is the ability to produce medical isotopes um, with a liquid fuel. Uh, one thing you could do is to include a loop that goes into the neutron flux and carries a, a liquid into the flux and out again. So we would be able to <clears throat> produce large volumes of radioisotopes, things like uh, technetium-99, uh, which is probably the largest usage of radioactive material for health medical purposes and others. Uh, so that would be a, a definitely a possibility. We can also use it to have a loop to, to manufacture plutonium-238, which is very important for space exploration. Yes, also there is another one, uh, last, uh, regarding about the corrosion. Right. Yeah, from Tamaga <clears throat> University. Right. So, uh, Yes, if you have a fluoride salt with some oxygen or moisture in it and it's hot, it is very corrosive. But if you take out the oxygen and moisture and you keep the redox level fine, then it is not nearly as corrosive. Uh, the estimate is that it will leach out about 20 microns of depth of the chromium per year. So if you wanna last for 40 years, you need to add one millimeter extra thickness to your piping. Uh, so that's perfectly fine for the vessel and for the pipes and the pump and everything. Uh, the only place that that really comes into play is the heat exchanger itself. The tubes, we don't want to add much in the way of thickness of the tubes because that has significant uh, heat exchanger performance impacts. Um, so the, the key is to keep the oxygen and moisture out and to keep the redox level proper. I could compare that as well to uh, water. If you have water at 300 degrees C with a little bit of salt in it, it is very corrosive. You have to work very hard to keep that water very pure or it will corrode away your vessel. So water with a little bit of salt is corrosive. Salt with a little bit of water is corrosive, but either one being pure with the right containers, you're okay. Okay, another question from Ivan Yeah, 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 Mr. Ivan Yeah, yeah, regarding about uh, what is uh, vibration. Can you read it, Mr. Lars? Yes, I can. I can read it. Yeah, yeah. Um, they talk about vibroacoustic disease due to low frequency noise that may occur and radiate from the generator in the plant. Um, the power conversion cycle is at the opposite end of the plant from the reactor. So yes, vibrations, you know, you have a, a 500 megawatt electric plant, that's a lot of power. So if even just a small fraction of that is lost to vibrations, that's a lot of vibration power. This is a, a problem that every power plant in the world has to deal with. And so 
Um, we have a suspension system. It's about 3,000 tons uh, for the foundation and springs and careful analysis. Uh, but this is a problem that uh, industry has faced and solved um, and deals with regularly. It's no different for us than for anybody else. Okay, thank you. And the last question, uh, Rob uh, Lars Harkinson, regarding, you know, in the uh, chat box. Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, this question is uh, steps to be prepared and uh, what countries have used thorium as the energy source so far. Um, so far, <coughs> thorium has been used only occasionally for energy source. The U.S. did it once with a uh, shipping port. Um, and the Germans had one. Uh, the in Indians are now just, are building one now. I don't think it's active yet. So using thorium as a fuel is not common yet. Uh, thorium though is quite common in the earth. Uh, it's about four times more common than uranium. But the truth is we have enough uranium and thorium that supply of fuel is not a major issue. Uh, the thorium is quite uniformly dispersed around the earth, so in any country can mine its own thorium. Um, okay. As far as being prepared. Another one, another one. Yeah, refueling. Uh, about, the next question is about refueling and yeah. ping pong. So, uh, how long does it take? Okay, so we, we so let, let me go through the cycle. We bring a new can in, it has no fuel in it. We bring a fresh fuel canister in, shipping cask, and we melt the fuel that's in it and we pump it into the core. So that's the startup fuel. And then we have another vessel in there that we have the makeup fuel, we pump that into the makeup fuel tank. Uh, then we operate for four years, transferring roughly one liter per day from the makeup tank into the core. Uh, at the end of four years, we pump the fuel salt over to the secondary can and we flush the primary can and to remove any leftover salt that's sticking to the sides. And then we let it cool for four years. At the end of four years, we come back with the ship and we take out the cooled can and we replace it with a new can and repeat the process. The uh, cooling doesn't have to be for four years. It can be shorter, but that's when we're coming back with the ship to bring new fuel in anyway. So that's the convenient time for us. That means that we can generate power for four years at a time and then we have to turn off the power plant for about a month, maybe two weeks, to service the turbine and to change the cans and to move the fuel around. It's really driven by the time required to service the turbine. The, the turbine needs its blades cleaned and needs its bearings checked periodically to keep it in tip top shape. Okay, thank you. Uh, as explained before by Mr. Sajitan, we have done some simulation research of a large Argentine, uh, with a group of uh, nuclear uh, at Blas Marat University. So it means we are supporting, you know, regarding about the uh, Torcon program in Indonesia. Okay, thank you. So that the world is and the participant will know exactly, yeah regarding about the Torcon technology. This is the world, you know, uh, the fr frontier of the Torcon technology. And also uh, they already submit uh, from the ARIS, yeah, ARIS in IIA. Yeah, it is, Hello? it is, yeah, or it is, it is posted in ARIS. Yeah, 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 of the one is, so it's with uh, the Torcon is uh, the, uh, the first one, you know, regarding about the submit uh, from the uh, descent. So hopefully, yeah. Yes. Uh, Bob, uh, last, yeah. 
uh, yeah, what is the program will run smoothly for the next couple years. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is good. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, one again, to all of you, my Mr. Lars Jorgensen and Pak Bob and Mbak Dita and all you know the representative of Torcon in Indonesia, and also for the participant. Yeah, it is very very interesting. Yeah, so we have to push uh, our student, our faculty member, yeah, to to study further regarding about you know to study deep and deep uh, for nuclear power plant because you know. Uh, like in the what is uh, I heard that the, you may be, uh, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, Mr. Lars Jerkinson, Bangladesh now you go uh, has already built you know nuclear power plant as well, and yes. also even though in uh, yeah, what is United United uh, Emirat Arab, Arab Emirat yes. yeah Emirat Arab no they have already built four nuclear reactor you know very big one nuclear reactor have uh, what is uh, have a power. Uh, 1,400 megawatt. So they built four. So we can imagine they produce a lot of oil, but they prepare, you know, prepare in the future. So we have to prepare Indonesia. Yes. This is correct. Mr. Lars, your concern about Bob. Yes, that's right. That's right. So yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Indonesia do not have enough energy. Actually, many people think that we have enough energy. Now, if we need to grow fourfold, fivefold, even if we need to catch up with uh, Malaysia and China, we need to grow fourfold uh, from the current capacity. Now, if we growing that fast and that big, we don't have enough energy uh, energy sources in Indonesia. So, without any question, that we need to go to nuclear. Without questions, definitely. So, okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah, yeah, agree yeah. about that one. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so, very much. Um, Miss Andin. Okay, thank you very much. Miss Andin. Yes, Miss Andin. Sir. Okay. This time is yours now. Time is yours. Yes. Will you give something to to Mr. Lars Jarkonson? Okay. Will you give something? Okay, prof. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Ari, to guide this event. Uh, last but not least, to appreciate Miss Mr. Lars as a keynote speaker in this night, we have a little gift for you, Mr. This is for you, Mr. Um, thank you very much to our keynote speaker, Mr. Lars Jurgensen, for giving a brilliant discussion. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's wrap up our event. I'm Anima Rani, and I apologize if I have a mistake when guide this event. Um, thank you very much for your coming. I wish you all a pleasant day. See you on the next event.